Brother Ramon, would you come up? Brother Ramon, and uh, he's our mission director. He's going to introduce Pablo. Hey, are we happy church yet? <laughs> oh, man, I tell you, I just kind of a little shift our direction here. You know what? It's kind of hard, but... Uh... Children, you are released and invited to go upstairs. I missed the four or five people making hand signals at me. Thank you. Hey, we're being led by the Holy Spirit, okay? <laughs> I just want to tell you, I want to borrow a statement from Oswald J. Smith. He said, the mission of the church is mission. Any church that is not seriously involved in helping fulfill the Great Commission has forfeited its biblical right to exist. That's a very powerful statement. You know, I just want to give you a little update that yes, our church, we need to continue to pray for our missions. All those countries there represented in those flags. We're blessed to uh, support and be a partner of over 50 missionaries and organizations in the world. And this church is involved with it. Amen. Praise God. I just want to give you a quick update. Last Sunday, we have convened our, our uh, mission board and just give you a little plug in here. If you are interested to serve as a volunteer as, in the mission board, please contact me because we are looking for some people to get involved with that. We are also anticipating to go back on a mission trip. It was kind of stopped for a year, visiting our missionaries and doing some local trips partnering with Operation Blessings in the U.S. when times comes that they need when there's a disaster. I'm in touch with the Director of Operations and with Operation Blessings. I'm in, excited to introduce our speaker today. Actually, about four years ago, we visited Nicaragua. We led about 12 people from our church, and we did mission, uh, marriage seminars and pastors meeting over there. You know, as a mission director, it's my job to not only just receive all these reports, but it's my job to see, to make sure that what they report is they're really doing it. And you know what? This guy is doing what he is doing and what he's reporting. We were blessed to go to that church and visit his ministry. And the Lord has relocated him to work and be associate pastor now in uh, Missouri, as I'm of God Church in Missouri. And... Uh, I just want to encourage you guys, I think, today, he preached two years ago at our mission conference, and man, he did a great job. I don't know if some of you remembered him, and I'm looking forward to it, and today he's going to share his vision. A couple of nights ago, he came to our house, and he shared with us what he's planning to do, and God's laid in his heart. And you know, I think I'm excited, and we support him, and I believe in him. God is using him. Let's partner with this man and what God is doing in his heart. Let's welcome Pastor Pablo. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Ramon. No pressure now. Like, oh my goodness. The whole service has been amazing and we have been enjoying since the very beginning. Worship has been great. How, have you? Have you felt the presence of the Lord in this place? Um, I'm just honored to be here. Fellowship of Believers has been, and by the way, English is not my first language. In case you were wondering, I, all, I always make that disclaimer. I know some of you already heard it before. Uh, it's not on purpose that I'm going to butcher your language. It's just the nature of the beast sometimes. So I apologize ahead of time. Uh, my name my full name is Paulo Javier Luisiga Salazar, uh, and I'm here with my whole family. My wife Anna is here. Uh, yeah, 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 and that, that's all of us. We have three kids, Natalia, she's turning 13, Santiago is eight, and Lydia is seven. Lydia is in kids' church right now. She was, she's always excited. Uh, and let me, before we jump in, uh, uh, we have one hour, right? 
one hour, two or three. You know, in our countries, if you want to have church, you need to be preached two hours. If it's not two hours, it's not, it's not, it's, it was not anointed enough. So, but today, I, I, I'm just kidding. We will, we, will, we will cut it out. I will try one hour only. We'll try one hour only. Um, and before we jump in, I just want to uh, share a little bit. When, when we came and we met this church, it was almost nine years ago, the first time that we had that contact. And I came on a Wednesday night. I'm gonna. I was going to speak on a Wednesday night service. And uh, and usually, when when a church is going, it was going to help and support the ministry. We just meet with the missions director and the pastor, and we talk a little bit of the ministry, and then. We just come on an agreement on how, how that is going to look like and everything. And, and I thought that was going to happen here in Fellowship of Believers. And I came in Wednesday night. I came early. And that day, I don't know if it was because the elders were going to meet or it was a special meeting. But they brought us into the meeting with all the elders here in the church. And I remember very well, Pastor Ramon was there. He, he had a little bit of less white hair back then. <laughs> Is myself, I didn't have that, that much white hair either. And, and we went through a whole process of an interview. It was, I mean, it was more intense than most of the job interviews I ever had in my whole life. It was, it was, I, I was not expecting it. And the first question, they look at me at the eyes. I was sitting with my wife. And the first question they ask is, are you guys married? And I would look, and I, I, Pastor Ramon has a lot more into that, like, uh, well, yes, we are married. But out of all that, I, I, right now, I, I look back, and I can smile at that, but it was wisdom. And I learned a lot from it, because sometimes you just assume things that are not right. And sometimes we need to ask those questions. So I learned a lot from that. And yes, we've been married now. This year is 19 years. 19 years of marriage. <coughs> I, was, I, I got married when I was 11. <coughs> it's 19 years. That's <coughs> it's quite a long time. So it's, I, I better move on, right? My wife, is start, when she starts doing this, it, it means that I need to go back. Um, and since then, the, the Fellowship of Believers has been uh, supporting the ministry in Nicaragua, in Central America. What we do in Nicaragua is we do church planting. And we do a lot of church planting in the rural, in the mountains in Nicaragua, in that kind of places where you drive and then you park the car, put on the backpack and just walk for a couple hours. That's the kind of, of ministry that we are doing there. When we started, we were, if I'm not mistaken, it was 10 churches back then. Right now, we have 40 churches and right now in 20, no, but listen, listen, not yet, not yet, wait, because it's more. 2021, we have 10 more church plants happening as we speak. 10 more. Yes, and all the glory is to the Lord. It's His kingdom. It's His work. Uh, and a couple years ago, we moved, uh, well, before I jump into that, um, the church in Matagalpa is the central church. It's the church that my wife and, and me, we planted. We bought an old theater. A very, very old theater is the Matagalpa Theater. It's one of those buildings that it's, it's, a very, it's part of the city, has been there forever. But it was not in really good shape. And, and some of you have been there, has been in Nicaragua. Pastor Ramon was there. Uh, some of the youth weren't there. And, and, and the building is amazing, but it was kind of rough. It was kind of rough. And, and, we, and it was needing a lot of, of structural work. But we were in the process of buying, so we are not going to put any money until it's ours, right? Um, and it got delayed in Nicaragua. We had a lot of uh, political turmoil in 2018. It was a coup and a lot of violence. A lot of that happened that year. Then in 2019, uh, we finally closed. We finally bought the building. It's completely ours. We started to work. And, but, and you know what's amazing when God's timing when we bought the building, it's, it's in, a, in a decent part of the city. It's in, the, in Matagalpa. It's downtown. But Matagalpa is a city that has a big river that goes inside the city. 
So in, in that river, there are only three bridges that cross that river. So everywhere where you have a bridge, immediately that road becomes one of the main roads in the whole city. Because all the traffic is going to go uh, around it. The building that we, will, we, will, we were buying, it was just next to the river. We bought the building. One month later, the city comes and says, you know what? We're going to build a bridge here. Just in front of this, we're going to build. And they build a bridge. And now the church, the location of the church is not only a good building, but now we are, in the, in, we are like in the hot, in the best location in the whole town. And everybody that goes in and goes out has to look at that building and just realize that that place belongs to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and I want to thank you because you guys partner with us through all that process and you help us. One of the biggest things that we needed to do was to fix the roof. The roof was really rough. It had like 60 years old uh, wood um, uh, work that needed to be done. Last year, we finally did it. Last year, I don't know if you're following me, last year. Last year, for most of us, it was a year that we wanted to go back and delete. And we needed, we wanted to go back and do that last year, in the kingdom of God, there's no crisis. In the kingdom of God, there's nothing is going to stop it. So last year, we were able, and we, and we finished the work this year, we put over $30,000 into replacing the whole roof. At first, we thought, we're just going to fix it just to make it safe. But I don't know, I don't know if you know how that works. As soon as you touch something, you need to redo the whole thing. And we end up doing the whole thing. We, we, we remove all the, we redid all the electrical system. Uh, and not only that, since they were already working and, and, and the church, when you are working inside the building, it's a big mess. There's dust everywhere. You know what? Let's keep doing. We start turning down walls. We make the room a lot bigger. And we redid the whole thing. And now you, you guys that have been there, if you go back, it's a complete different place now. And when I came, Pastor Chris asked me, okay, we moved with my wife and my family to the States. We are in Missouri. We are uh, also planting a church in a city in, in, the, in southern Missouri. It's a small town named Branson, Missouri. Is Yeah, I, I know. It's, it's, it's a small town. But let me tell you, it's only inside city limits. It's only 13,000 people. When you expand to all the surrounding areas, it's like 65, 70,000 people. But in that small town, any given day, when it's the tourist season, that as most of you probably heard about the tourist season in Branson, there's over 100,000 people that comes to visit every day. So it's, it, it is, because of that, it's a, it's a place that has so many theaters, that has more theater seats than Broadway, New York. And because of that kind of industry they do in the hospitality industry in, the, in town, there's people coming from all over the world to live and work there. You know, all the hotels and all the restaurants. So you walk around, there's people from all over the place. And not only from all over the world, but even from the United States. That there's people coming from all over. And the Lord just laid in our hearts, you know what? I think that Branson kind of needs a church that has a little bit of more, more international flavor. A church that could actually go and re start reaching out to all those communities, to all that people and come together. It has to be in English because that's the language that is going to bring all these communities, no matter where you are coming from, together. Yeah. It has to be in English yeah. with an accent. <laughs> and it happens that I have an accent. So... So, and that, that's what we have been doing. We are launching right now. We are meeting uh, Sunday evenings. We are launching late October. So, if 2022, if any of you happen to be in that area, Branson, Missouri, just look for us, like City Church, and you are going to be surprised because God is already doing great things. Now, the ministry in Nicaragua keeps going. When I came, Pastor Chris asked me, hey, so how's the church in Matagalpa? And I just look at him like, that's a hard question. They are doing better now that I'm not there. <laughs> so I don't know if it's because we, we kind of train and build and equip the leadership or, or, or what. I think that that's what it was. We, I prefer to go that route. But uh, it's amazing all what God is doing. 
Uh, and I loved being here. I love all the testimonies we just heard. Uh, through our ministry, receiving a lot of missionaries all over, we always hear your guys and your girls and all the boys and kids that you take give testimonies and share their testimonies there. And there is something that a lot of people, when they start sharing their testimony, they start uh, saying, I grew up in church. So right now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a short story. And I want you to follow me. Use your imagination. It's not my story. That's first disclaimer. But it, it is about a guy who grew up in church. He used to come every time the church was open. He was there. And he would love to come to, to all the events in church, all, all, the, all the Sunday school, everything. And he was the best student. He was the best kid. He was that kid that he will memorize the Bible verses and he will go and he will repeat them back at home. And he will go and come back next week and he will still know it. He will be the first one to run to worship. He would be that kind of kid that, that you know that... that he, he, he wants to know God. He's doing everything. And, and, and he never missed a day. And he grew up. He kept growing up. When he grew up, he moved up to middle school and then to youth. And in all those years that they were, that those years for a lot of us, they were rough. But not for him. He kept coming to church. He kept being that student that was almost a model for all the others. Never using any kind of profanity coming out of his lips. He, he, was, he knew his Bible. He knew everything that he, need, he needed to know. And he kept coming to church. He knew what he wanted in life. He was doing very good in school too. It's not only that he was good in church. He was good at home and he was good in school. He went to college. He graduated and, and, and he was doing really good. And as in all his college years, he kept going to church. And he kept always the Bible close to his heart. He found a good job afterwards. And the job was good and he was making good money. He was driving the car that he wanted to drive. And he kept the Bible close to him. But even if he kept the Bible close, he always felt like, Something is missing. I'm missing something here. I don't know exactly what it is. But I know that it got to be more. It has to be more somewhere. I'm missing something. He, he always had that feeling inside of him. And then one day he heard about an, an itinerary preacher coming into town. And he went to check it out. And he heard, and what he heard was amazing. The message that that teacher was speaking was incredible. Because it was not just from the scriptures, but he was making the scriptures come alive. And immediately he started hearing a message that contained power of God. He says, I think that's what I'm missing. And he kept coming. And then in the, in the meetings of that teacher, he would call people, hey, you, do you need a miracle? And they would start bringing all the people who were sick, and the teacher would pray, and they would be healed. Yeah. And the guy is just looking at all that. Like, I never seen this. I read my Bible. I know, all, you know, I know all, all, all my Bible verses. I know exactly what I do believe, but I never seen this, and I think this is what I need. I need to talk to this guy. I need to talk to this teacher. I need to know what it is that he has that I am missing. I, I, I need to find what it is. And he kept coming. And one day, he finally was able to come closer to the teacher. And if you have your Bible, we're going to pick up there. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16, 26. And I'm reading from the ESV as well. Matthew 19, verses 16 to 26. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, 
What good deed must I do to have eternal life? The Gospels describe him as a young, rich man. Look at, he was the young ruler. Everybody knew that he had money. Everybody knew he was doing good in life. But he came and said, Lord, teacher, what good deed I must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Jesus said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? All these I have kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Father, we come to you right now and I pray. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Prepare our hearts to receive your word, challenge us to live a life for your glory. Help us to hear your voice clear and loud. I pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So this guy, he comes to Jesus and he had it all, but he was still seeking. He was still looking. He says, I get all these commandments. I know all my religion. I know all my tradition. And listen, when I, I, I I'm going to be completely honest. We are almost family right here, right? Listen, 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 I said one hour, right? If you amen me a lot, it might, I, I, I tend to speak faster. So you can, yeah, there, there you go, there you go, there you go. So this guy, he, he comes and he says, I know all my Bible, I know all my tradition, I know everything. But Jesus, I feel I'm missing the point. There has to be something because I feel that I'm lacking. So is this guy who is who knows his Bible, who knows his commandments, who knows what he's supposed to be doing, and he's probably doing it every day, but still feel that he's lacking. Still feel that he's lacking. How many of you husbands here? You lose something. We even hear a testimony today about losing something. You lose something at home and you don't find it anywhere. And you need to call your wife. Hey, uh, um, I lost my shoe. I don't know where it is. And for some reason, the wife comes into the room and she just look and it's right there in front of you, in front of your eyes, and you haven't found it. How many? How many? I, I, I need to. I, it's me. And I know all the wives right now like, amen. Amen. I don't know what it is. We guys... We have a problem searching. We have a problem finding stuff, right? Now, and, and it, has, it has happened to me a few times that, that you need something and you go into the room to look for it. And when you enter into the room, you forget what you're looking for. And then you are in the center of the room and you're lost and you're like, okay, what I was looking for. And you start looking around to see if you find a hint somewhere that you are looking for something. And, you're like, uh, uh, and then you give up and you go back and then you remember again what you were looking for and then you come back. Let me tell you something. Unless you know what you are looking for, you are never going to find it. Unless you know what you are looking for, you will never find it. That seems like, a, well, that, that's kind of like, I mean, it's basic. It's, that's not rocket science, right? But how many of us, we go like these men, searching, looking. We know that we are lacking something. We know that we are missing something. We know that we are losing, but we don't know what we are looking. We don't know what we are searching. And because we don't know what we are looking, we will never find it. 
And I know there is people even here today in this room that you know that you are lacking. You know that you are missing something. You see all that is happening around you. And you see the power of God being displayed in this place. But you feel that you are missing something. Unless you know what you are looking, you will never find it. This guy comes and he's completely honest. Lord, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? What good deed? Tell me just the recipe. I just, I just want to make sure I have eternal life. What do I need to do? Just give me the list. I, have, I, I got everything to go by the book, to go all the check marks because that's what I want. And Jesus looks at him. And he just says the command is 6, 7, 8, and 9. And then goes back to the fifth command. That's what Jesus did in order. This is what you need to do. One, two, three, four, five. And the guy looks at him. And I imagine that moment he started like. I do that. All the time. That's how we are. We want to follow instructions. We want to do what we think we need to do and just check all the marks. I did this, 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 and this. The problem, that's not how it works in the kingdom. Because it's not on your merit. It's not on your work. It's nothing that you can do. And that's why we need to surrender to Jesus Christ. And that's why we need to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit. This guy didn't know what he was asking for. And then he says, okay, I do all this. And maybe that's where you are right now. I do all that. I come to church every Sunday. I even dress up a little bit on Sundays. <laughs> Let me tell you, I know I, know I am in Florida when I see more flip-flops than boots. <laughs> Nothing against flip-flops. That's good. I even dress up a little bit to go to church. I, uh, some, some, I mean, I go beyond that. I, I'm faithful with my tithes and offerings. I serve. I'm going to sign up to be one of the small group leaders. And we try to go by the book. We try to do all what we can. But it's not what you can. It's what you cannot do what it matters. It's that portion when you say, you know what, Lord? I cannot do this. I cannot do that. I need you in my life. I need to trust in you. I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to give up whatever is hindering me right now. And I'm going to walk in your power. That's when really, really, really we are getting to the point. Now, Jesus come and Jesus look at him and tell him, okay, you do all that? And remember, the purpose of the law was not to save the people. The purpose of the law was actually to show them that nobody would be saved by the law. Because nobody could keep all the commandments. So he maybe was lying a little bit over there when he said he was keeping all that. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, if you're like me, a good gossip could go a long way. Probably he was lying. But Jesus looked at him. Jesus looks at this guy. He tells him, okay, if you want to go all the way in, want to go all the way in, sell everything you have and follow me. What an invitation. What an invitation. Matthew heard that invitation. Hey, follow me. And Matthew dropped all his business, tax collecting, and he followed Jesus. Amen. Peter, follow me. And Peter dropped his fish net. He walked outside. He know where he park. Beep, beep. That's made my boat. And he followed Jesus. You see, Jesus did not ask the same for everybody. Jesus did not ask Peter, sell all your business and follow me. He didn't. He just said, follow me. And Peter did. And we know that because after Jesus' crucifixion, you know what Peter did? He went back to his business. He had his boat. He kept it. He knew what he parked. It's Peter, fish company. In this case, in this case, Jesus looked at him and he asked, sell everything that you have and follow me. It's a high cost. But that offer of following Jesus to be a, now for us, is like, oh my goodness, this guy is so dumb. This guy, and some of you will even use uh, 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 words that are more 
stronger words to describe this guy. Because he is getting the offer of his life. Sell everything that you have and follow Jesus and be a witness of the Messiah walking on earth. And be a witness of all the miracles. Be a witness of the power of God. All what you need to do is sell everything you have. But he had a lot. And he walked away sorrowful, sad. Now what happened there? What happened? Jesus asked the one thing he was not willing to give up. You should just look at him. And he knew that that was the problem. His attention was divided. It's my career, my fame, my business. And I just want God to bless me. But I want to keep everything. I just want a little bit of God because, you know, it's cool to have a little bit of God over my business, over my family, over all my finance, over everything. I just want a little bit of sprinkle. Have you seen the guy that sprinkled the salt like this? That's all what we want is God just to come and sprinkle a little bit of his blessings over my business. And it's not like that. It's surrender all. Give it all to Jesus Christ. And when you realize that everything that you have, all your business, all your family, everything actually belongs to God, it changes how you relate to all the things that you have here on earth. Your fishing boat belongs to God. Your house belongs to God. Your TV belongs to God. Ooh, that's a touchy. Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> cell phones too belongs to God. So just keep in mind that. I mean, whatever you are looking on the TV, where you're looking in the little screen, this is God's device. It should change the way how we relate and how we see things. Isn't it? That's God's TV. I should not be watching that. This is God's device. I should not go there. Uh, this is too touchy. We're going to move on to something nicer. Yeah, yeah. There's a great preacher, David Platt, says radical obedience to Christ is not easy. It's not comfort, not health, not wealth, and not prosperity in this world. Radical obedience to Christ risks losing all these things. But in the end, such risk finds its reward in Christ. And he is more than enough for us. Now, I, had a, I, had, I, I, I went to a, a conference back when, when, I was, when I was in youth. And we had a preacher coming from Phoenix, Arizona. He was a, a well-known preacher. He was doing a, it was a big youth conference. Kids from all over Central America. We congregated in El Salvador. And he was preaching. And he shared his testimony that God, that got engraved in my heart. And I know I shared it here. And I want to share it again because you guys, I, I recognize only half of you. So only half of you have heard this story. And he, basically he was saying that he, one day he was praying to God and he was praying exactly what we just sang. Lord, I surrender all to you. Everything belongs to you. And he says that he was in his quiet time and he was doing it by himself in church. And then he heard a voice speaking loud to him. Are you really giving everything to me? He says like, yes, Lord, I'm giving everything to you. Okay, give me your car. Put the keys of your car in the altar. And he's like, <laughs> I just bought these, Lord. It's like, it's the first time I buy a new car. I still, still have the new car smell in it. Give me the keys. This guy took out the keys. He says he started crying. And the first thing came into his mind is, my wife is going to kill me. He laid the keys in the altar. And he kept praying, Lord, I give it all to you. And you see, I'm proving it right now. And then he heard the same voice. Okay. Now give me your house. Like, I'm going to be homeless. Give me your house. Lord, and he said that he struggled with that. And he was a long time. He was praying and he was broken. And he took out the keys of his house and he laid them in the altar and said, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I trust you. My house is yours. And then the Lord says, well, I'm not done yet. Give me your family. Not, not my kids. Not, not my children, not my wife, no, no, 
I mean, you get everything, all my possessions. You got my car, you got my, my, my house, you got all, the, all that stuff that is very important. I'm making a point. I'm giving it all to you, but not my family. And he says he struggled and, and, and he cried in that altar for a long time. And he finally said, you know what, Lord? I don't know. But yeah, my family is yours. And after he did that, he heard the same voice telling him, okay, pick up the car. Pick up the house and take your family. But remember, they are all mine. Amen. They are all mine. Yes. He says, he took that. He says, thank you for the car, Lord. Thank you for the house. Amen. But that's not how we all should feel. That's not how we all relate to all our possessions. Everything actually belongs to God. Right. Yes, right. Now, this is not the end of the story either. Because all that happened and everybody, since everybody knew that he was a young rich man and Luke said that he was a young ruler, everybody knew that he was somebody that he had some money. For the, for the Hebrews in those days, for the Jews in those days, that was a proof of God's blessing over your life. If you were doing good, it's because God was with you. So everybody saw him and everybody said, oh, he's the blessed man. Oh my goodness, he's enjoying so much of the blessing of the Lord. So for them to see him walk away sorrowful and not being able to follow Jesus, all the disciples there start thinking, okay, what's going on here? And then verse 23 says, and Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Is Jesus saying that being rich is bad? No, he's not saying that. We all know that. We all, we, we all know enough Bible to know that. Not, he's not saying that being rich is bad. If, that, if it was bad, that King David, he would be in serious trouble. And let's not go with King Solomon because he was loaded. And so and, and you, you have all those. This is a descriptive. It's not prescriptive. So Jesus says it's hard for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Then Jesus goes and, and he tells this analogy. It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you have heard, probably all of you have heard that there is in, in Jerusalem, there was the big gate that they were closed at night. But there was a narrow gate that they would... Keep it there for all the people who came late and, and they came after the gate was locked. And that narrow gate was known as the eye of the needle. So when you would come, if you come with all your possessions, if you bring your camel and everything, for the camel to actually fit through that door, you needed to remove all the burdens from the camel. And the camel needed to crawl through that to go to the other side. How many of you heard that story before? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, that's not true. That there is no archaeological proof of such a thing. Okay? So I'm sorry to disappoint you. That's not, that's not what Jesus is saying. There is no such thing as a needle eye gate. And, and now, I know some people say, hey, Pastor, I've been in Jerusalem and I've seen one of those. Yes. Yeah, and let me tell you, uh, I don't, you come on, the, Sarasota is very touristy. Very touristy, right? And if, the, if, if you start getting tourists, looking for the eye of the needle door, I can guarantee you that we will find one somewhere and we will be in display for all the people who's going to come and look for it. I'm just saying. I live in Branson. It's very touristy. Not everything is true. We have a King Kong hanging from a building there. That's not true. It's not the real King Kong. So that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus, is just, he just takes the biggest animal that they knew. It's a camel. Have you seen a camel? They are huge. It's just that what he's saying. This is a big camel. Try to make it in the little thing that they knew. It was the eye of the needle. Try to make that camel go through the eye of the needle. It's impossible. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? And Jesus said in verse 26, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible. But with God... All things are possible. Let's read that final part all together. With man, come on. 
This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. What Jesus was asking was surrender your heart. Surrender all. And I, I, know, I, I, I know it was the Holy Spirit because since we started this service, that's the same message we have been hearing all along. From the very beginning. Just with a different flavor. Just with a different accent. Just using different words. But it's been the same message that the Lord is speaking this morning. Yeah. Surrender all. Yeah. That's what he is asking. He is not content with just a portion of you. Just a little bit of your heart. He wants it all. Right. And my question to you is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to be like that young rich man? and going to say, uh, 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 Lord, I love you, but this portion, this little part is mine. You are not welcome to come and take it. I'm going to walk away. Or you can just say, you know what, God? I need you. I surrender all to you. Now, what does it mean for us today that we need to surrender all to him? It can mean different things for each one of us. In the case of this young rich man, what the Lord was asking was to give up all those things that was taking all his time and his love. So all those, all those possessions. Maybe for you it's to step up in faith. Maybe for you it means to actually sign up to lead a group. Maybe for you it's to actually surrender your life to Jesus Christ and recognize that he is Lord and he is King. It could mean different things. And you know the beauty of the story. When Jesus said for men, all things, all, the, all that what you see is impossible. With me, with God, all things are possible. The beauty of that is that brings hope. Because maybe right now you are sitting there and you feel broken. And you need hope. And you know that your life is a mess right now. You know right now where you are. That you are living in darkness. That you are living in bondage. And you think that you are out of reach of the grace of God. And that it's impossible for you to come into the presence of a holy God. Into the throne. And let me tell you, it is impossible for you. That's why we need Jesus Christ as our priest. That's why we need him. Because he's, his righteousness, what he gives us, and now we can present ourselves in the righteousness of Jesus into the presence of the Father, into the throne. But it's possible. With God, it's possible. And he says, all things are possible. Yeah. You know, when Jesus comes, he restores and he brings freedom. Yeah. And he brings his light and he brings his power. And then we, we start walking in complete freedom and we start having joy. And we have purpose and we have meaning. And even right now in the 21st century, we are hearing the voice of Jesus crying out and calling you and calling me and telling us, follow me. Are you going to respond to that and says, yes, I'm ready to follow you. Whatever that looks like, I'm ready to present myself as a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. Are you ready to present yourself as a living sacrifice? I read one of these days, so this is not mine. Don't tweet it and say that I, I, it was mine. I read it somewhere. I don't remember where. Somebody said, the problem with the living sacrifice is that that jumps out of the altar. That's the problem with the living Let's try, try to present a little goat as a living sacrifice, a live goat into the fire. You think that the goat is going to jump happily to the fire? Like, yeah, it's not. He 
it requires obedience. It requires everything for us to come and say, Lord, I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice today. Stepping into the fire of the presence of God. Lord, whatever it is, all what I have, my future, my dreams, my possessions, my family, everything I lay down to you is yours. And when we do that, the power of the Holy Spirit, it will manifest itself in such a marvelous way that everybody's going to look and say, I don't know what's going there, what's going on there, but there is such a fire that they cannot stop it. The world cannot um, uh, do anything against it. That church is living in such a powerful way that everybody's going to be astonished. And we need to surrender all. Our own views. Everything that is hindering us. We need to surrender all. Just imagine your life. Calling right now. Jesus coming and saying. Follow me. And if Jesus was. In the, guy, in the case of this guy. It was his possession. What would be Jesus asking of you? And no, don't say it right now. Don't say it. One time like, oh, he's asking for my husband. No, no, no. Judge right now is between you and the Lord. What would be Jesus asking to you right now? What he would be asking? He would be asking for your time. Perhaps faithfulness in finances or service. I love what Brother Jared said. He thought he was retiring. I'm sorry, brother. You never retired of the kingdom of God. <laughs> you can try, but you will not do it. So I don't know what the Lord is asking you right now. And listen, I am not afraid of awkward silences. So I'm going to close my mouth for a few seconds. And I want to just ask you, you just ask the Lord, Lord, what are you asking me to do? What do I need to give up? And I hope that you heard right now the voice of the Spirit speaking. Father, we come to you right now. I want to thank you because we see your grace and we see you moving. And I want to thank you for this church. Thank you, Father, for fellowship of believers because this church has an understanding of the kingdom and your mission to the world. And I pray a blessing over this church. And today we surrender everything to you. We give it all because we want to make room for you, Holy Spirit. We want to get rid of all those things that are hindering us, that are stopping us. Because we want to make room. So Holy Spirit, move. Move with power. The miracles and the healings is just the beginning of your work in this place. Because there is more. And I pray for this city that you may start touching the hearts of all those families who are broken right now in their homes. They may find restoration. They may start healing, he hearing that this is a house of healing. 
that this is a house where the power of God is present. And I pray, Lord, for all of us who are, we are here, prepare us. Here's my hands. You can say, Lord, here's my hands. Here's my mouth, my feet, my arms, all what I am right now, Lord. Prepare us to receive the harvest that you have prepared. To minister to all those who are gonna come seeking refuge in a world that does not provide it looking for hope and seeking for joy knowing that they are lacking knowing that they are missing something so lord i pray prepare our hearts to show the world to be a testimony to this world of your grace of your love of your might of your anointing of who you are jesus christ we belong to you. And with our mouth, we confess that you are Lord and you are King. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. And amen. And I want to thank you, Fellowship of Believers, for your love through the years, your encouragement. Because it was, it's been many moments when, when we felt alone. And we we're wondering if what we were doing, it really mattered, if it was really making a difference. And many times, you guys as a church, stepping up and praying for us, maybe without knowing it, it meant the world to us. And I want to thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity. And thank you for your courage. Because I can, the moment that you walk into this room, you know this is not a fearful church. And now that I hear the keyboard, I feel like I, can, I could keep preaching, but yeah, I get too excited. I'm sorry. So thank you. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Could, uh, so here's what we're going to do. We want to pray for, for uh, Pablo and Anna and their family, if they're willing to come up here, and just a couple of our leaders. Uh, join us. It'd be great. And then after that, uh, we'll have some of our leaders and prayer team up here if you'd like prayer for something today. Ask the congregation to please rise and join us in prayer. Stretch forth your hand. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and we are thankful to you, Lord. God, we as a church, Lord, we are obeying the great commission that you said in your word, Lord, that go and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded them to do. Lord, you have your servant here, Lord. Pastor Pablo, Anna, and the whole family. Obeying that great commission, Lord, that you have entrusted in their hearts and in their lives, Lord. God, we as this church of FOB, Lord, are partnering with them. God, that you will help them, Lord, strengthen them, God. I pray for their blessing, Lord, and all the things that they needed, Lord, to start the church in Branson, Missouri. Lord, that we will partner with them and pray for them, Lord. God, that your gospel will be preached to that area, Lord, and reach the different ethnic groups in that city, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, strengthen them spiritually, physically. God, I pray for your team, that you will be with them, bind them together, Lord, and that this church, Lord, will be established for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Bless you. So if a few of our uh, leaders and prayer team would just come up to the altar. If you'd like prayer today, come forward. We'll pray with you. Otherwise, be blessed. Thank you for coming. We pray a blessing over you. 
and a hedge of protection as you go. We just thank you that the life of the Lord would be in your homes this week. In your name, Jesus, amen. See you next week. Quick, uh, he told me that he's going to have his first service in October 24. Lord willing, would like to go and be a part of that. So if any one of you would like to join them, go to Preston, Missouri, and join them in that first service. I think that will be, that will be exciting.